Like, Don't you hear me? Whatever the, the TV shows tell us. <laughs> he says, No, show your face, I want to see. And if he manifests it, he would appear in a manifest form in Satchkan, in the human form with eyes and nose and ears. So much closeness he has, so much love he has for the highest form he has created, that when you see the lords of different regions, who have, who have taken those positions by virtue of their karma, their good deed, they got rewarded by becoming lords of different regions. They are all different looking. They look different from us. When we go right up to the top, the creator himself, he looks like us. So much is the similarity. But this is not the similarity for which this statement is famous, that he has made us in his own image. This is not the real reason. The real reason is that he has put into our consciousness that ability to choose which he alone enjoys. And this ability has not been shared with anyone else in creation. That's what makes this human form the highest form of creation. And it is this form, when we get it, we are the luckiest people anywhere in creation. One man once came to the great master and he said, Master, I heard your lecture today, heard your discourse. And you said the human form is the greatest form in this universe. In my next life, will you make me a human being? <laughs> Master said, are you a donkey now? <laughs> you are looking for next life? Don't you realize that the very thing you heard, you are enjoying now? You have this human form now. Don't lose it. Do you know when you got it? Do you still have total recollection, total recall of all your lives? Do you remember what you were like since you have an immortal soul, since you have an immortal consciousness? Do you remember what you looked like before you were born? Do you remember what you looked like 200 years ago? Do you remember what you looked like 1000 years ago? Do you remember what you were like a million years ago? The soul, your consciousness with which you have come up to me as a seeker is longer living than that. Do you remember your forms? No, oh, I don't even remember what I looked like like a baby. Forget about last life. If we don't even remember what we look like and we have to go by somebody else's knowledge of what we look like, it's a great day to know at least what we look like today. We have been through all these species. We have evolved in forms. We have been insects. We have been trees. We have been fish and fowl and animals and human beings too. And we have had all these experimental forms to bring us to the top of creation. To a human being who can seek. There's a top of creation. There's nothing higher than that. If you want to go above the top, then you start going down. You can't go above the top. The top is the top. That's what Einstein said. If you go to the end of the universe, you'll come back where you are. That is the end of the universe. There's a time warp and there is a there is a curvature of time and space which you cannot avoid. If the concept of infinity takes you to the infinite end of infinity, you must be where you are again. So if you go to the top, you go to the top that is a human form, it's the top of creation. You have a choice, either become the creator or go back into the cycle again. And you have gone through the cycle over and over again. You don't believe it? Smarten up your memory. <laughs> go back. There's a memory lane right inside. It's not outside. You're carrying it, the whole of it, in your mind. You don't believe that these things exist in the mind? All it look in the brain. You don't believe there is any uh, such fine thing which cannot be seen. It has to be in matter. Yes, look into the matter. Take, look into your brain cell. Look into the genetic code. Study all the chromosomes. See your entire history. See the history of one million years built into it. It's written there. Every human baby born, an embryo, conceived. A one day old embryo contains the entire history of mankind. You don't believe it? Go and see it. Just improve your microscope a little bit. You will see. We haven't tried to improve them. We're seeing a lot more now than we did 50 years ago when Great Master mentioned these things. And we are learning what he told us. The whole history. But if we can't find our memory here, we can look at the memory there. <clears throat> the memory will tell us. We have been through so many forms. 
And so many times we got a chance to be on the top. Like the Ferris wheel. We got a chance again and again and we missed it. Why? Because we listened to our mind. And the mind said, do this and don't do this and be judgmental and be good and be bad. And we were good and we got rewarded in the next life. We were bad and we got punished in the next life. But we kept on having a next life. Whatever we did, under the direction of the mind, made us have a next life and a next life. And the cycle went on and on indefinitely. We are in that place in the cycle. And we can't get out of it. And the great master says, this is because of our overwhelming obedience to, overwhelming reliance upon our own mind. What is the alternative? A man sits in a cave and says, I am going to do meditation. He digs a cave on the side and says, nothing will bother me, not even the waves of the ocean, not even the uh, buzzing of the trees. I'll put a big rock in front. I'll lock myself in and I'll have nothing but myself. And he locks himself in and his mind tells him all the stories and what to do. He can't get out of it. You don't have to run away from the world. You have to run away from your mind. How can you run away from your mind? He's sitting right inside you. Where will you run? When the mind is sitting so close inside us and we want to run away from the mind who is messing us up, where will we run? That was the greatest contribution great master made to me in my life. And I want to share this with you on this Bandara day. He told me, if you want to run from the mind, the only place you can run to the mind is to the great master. At least you have something to run to. Otherwise, you have nothing to run. Look at all this world. Look at all your friends. Look at all your associates. Look at all your relatives. Look at, they are all associated with you for give and take. They are all associated to serve out as if there is a big account you are settling with them. The law of karma. That you are doing nothing but karmic receipts and payments are going on. Karmic sometimes very physical terms. You give $50 there, or receive $100 from here, or more often in emotional terms, somebody pains you, somebody disappoints you, it's there. We get attached there, and we don't know where to get away from. We don't know how to get out of attachment. Then we say, we want to be detached, and we run and get attached somewhere else. The whole world is nothing but a series of traps around us, and whichever side we look, they trap us. And we find it's just another form of a trap, another form of a karma. Where can we run? Is there a place we can really run from our own mind? We say we can run to the Lord inside. Isn't the Lord inside? Of course he is inside. Of course we can run to the Lord inside. Provided we can recognize him. It is true. Whoever has ever told me, why do you always talk of a physical master outside? Why don't you talk of the master inside? And I say, my friend, I tried my, with my loudest voice to talk of the master inside. Nobody listens. Every time I said master inside, they said, yes, I hear a voice. Every time I talked of the master inside, the master is always inside. And they talked of their mind as if that was the master. What could I do? I have been left with no option. That whenever I say to people, the master exists nowhere but inside, they don't listen to me. They start identifying that master with their own mind. Therefore I say, master is inside, listen to the master. But first know that is the master. And who will tell you that you are listening to your mind or to your master? Who will tell you this? Well, we can use our own judgment. <laughs> That's the same mind in the disguise of a master. This is a, this is a stumbling block for so many seekers. I sometimes cry in my heart. That here are so many seekers, they really want to seek, and they are stumbling against their own mind and being ripped off by their own mind in the spiritual road. A great master, a human being, another human being, not oneself. Oneself, one's mind is faulty. It is faulted by the fact we have no way to know inside if the mind is speaking or the Lord is speaking. But another human being who is in touch with the Lord to our reasonable satisfaction. That other person is in touch with the Lord. At least that person can tell us if we are listening to the mind or not. 
if this role is performed by a physical master, it's good enough. No more is needed. If a physical master, if a physically enlightened person comes into our life and can just tell us how to distinguish between the fake image of the mind and the real Lord speaking as a master inside, if a physical being can tell us this and tell us correctly, he has done his job. The rest can be taken care of by the master's insight. The role of the master outside is very limited. The role of the master outside, the physical being, whom we call an enlightened being, whom we call the great master, whom we see in physical form as another human being, that role is very limited to introducing us to the immortal permanent master who is inside. And is called the word, the shabad, the naad, the melody, the harmony, the endless music, the unspoken language, the unwritten language. That's the real master. And that master is inside us and not outside. When we look outside, we are looking at the role, limited role of the human being. But why do we have to look outside? Because there is no way we have enmeshed with this terrible mind and having seen for so many incarnations that we couldn't get out of it. Even this one we cannot get out of it. Having had that experience, we need the help of somebody who is enlightened. Now there comes the rub. That's the other big stumbling block. If that master, that truth, must come in the form of an enlightened one, must come in the form of a human being who can speak to us, how can we be sure? It's a real human being who is enlightened or is just a fake a con man? There are so many con men masquerading as gurus and masters can we be sure? The truth is we can never be sure. Therefore, we can never find one. So that's the worst part of the story, that after knowing that a master can exist in a human form, to be told you can't find it. That you may have all the different tests to apply. A real good con man can pass those tests, at least for a while, and say, yes, I'm the master. But uh, but watch out, till he says, give me a check. <laughs> but some con men can say, we don't take checks. We take cash. <laughs> give it to Karen. <laughs> don't give it to me. There is no way that any of these artificial tests can give us a true convincing answer. This human being who speaks like he is in touch with the Lord is actually in touch with the Lord. There is no way. There is no intellectual way to determine this. There is no physical way to determine this. What do we do? We are seekers. We want the master. We want a perfect master. We don't know how to find one. What do we do? The answer great master gave was, don't find one. Get found by one. Very simple. That the true master does not have to be found. He finds you. Then you are ready. That's why they say, when the chela is ready, the guru appears. Nobody has ever said in the Eastern philosophy that you go and find a good guru. They always said, when the chela, the disciple, the seeker, when the disciple is ready, the guru will appear. Obviously, if you don't even tell the guru that you want a guru, you hide it in your heart. You seek in your own heart and don't tell anyone you are seeking. Just in your own heart, keep on seeking. And you keep on closing your eyes and seeking and people look what happened. You say, I, I won't tell you. And then someone comes along by a strange coincidence in your life and says something that touches your heart, gives the answer without your mentioning it. Watch out. Maybe you are being found. Not before that. This is not a game of hide and seek in which we have to seek and the Lord has to hide. The whole world is trying to find the Lord in a hide and seek game where they think the Lord is hiding behind, behind mountains and behind clouds and behind heavens and so on and we are the seeker. No! This is a game of hide and seek where we are hiding from the Lord and He is seeking us and we run away, He still finds us. If He doesn't find us, I venture to suggest to be very careful 
before you call such a person a perfect living master. A perfect living master is one who comes to us through a strange path, not in direct seeking, who comes to us because we seek within, who comes to us when our seeking has reached a certain level, who discloses, reveals himself gradually according to how much we are ready to accept. And he does it without our having to talk to him about it. Of course, it has happened often. I saw great master. He played this miracle on so many people. People would come and say, Boy, he knows our heart before we even come here. And they came and said, Master, how did you know this was in my heart? He says, What was in your heart? I know nothing. They said, Don't play this game with us. He would still play the game. Many people have asked me, why do masters act so human? When they know everything, they have revealed, they have performed miracles, they have drawn us with love and a power that we couldn't see, and there is no question, our whole life has been altered because of that. Because of the influence of a man, we have totally changed in our life, and then we come across him, he turns out to be so human, making such human mistakes and foibles, why does he do it? Why doesn't he say straight, yes, I am the master you are waiting for? Well, one answer is very simple. If he says that, he'll look like the other charlatans. Who says, I am the master standing here? Maybe he distinguishes himself from that. But more important than that, far more important than that, he does it because he has come. This is the same truth being manifested in flesh. The same word manifested in flesh for our benefit so that the form should be like us. Unless he is like us, we can never fall in love with that person. If that being is so high and mighty, we can admire, worship, be in awe, but can never have love for that person. But if we find this person is so human, so ordinary, so ordinary, more ordinary than many people we know, there's a likelihood that may be the one. Because it is by his ordinariness, excessive ordinariness, that he can be like us and make himself lovable for us and make us his beloveds. This relationship of love between the master and the beloved is the purest thing that ever existed. All these matter and molecules and atoms disappear here. Nothing exists in the uh, in the regions of energy. When you go, this world collapses and goes into a black hole and disintegrates and nothing is left of this matter, you still have the energies in which you can see a lot of things. All the energies are left behind and all the senses are left behind. You may have a world of thoughts and ideas. They also disappear. Everything disintegrates. But one thing which we are experiencing here is human form that does not disintegrate with the disintegration of the universes is the experience of love. That is why they say, love is God. God is love. This experience of love never disintegrated itself. It has never disappeared. In any dissolution of the universes, love has survived and never disappeared. Therefore, the relationship of a perfect living master, that means a perfect Master who has his contact in consciousness with the highest regions of awareness and is now living, now residing amongst us in a human form. Such a perfect living master and our relationship as a seeker with such a master is based upon love, not upon understanding, not upon material relationship, not upon physical relationship, not upon anything else except pure love. To make this possible in the physical world, the master affects us. As we see gradually in association with the master, he affects us inwardly, in our soul, in our heart with his love. And the more human he is, the more ordinary he is, the more we have the experience of love with him. And the less ordinary he is, the more we have experience of awe, magic, jugglery, something to look into get into a sidetrack. Side he has not come here to draw a crowd to himself. No perfect living master has ever walked upon this earth to draw a large crowd and to show them games. 
No perfect master has ever come here in order to display wealth, to display powers in this physical world. No perfect living master has come to show how smart he is in mathematics or algebra. No perfect master has ever come into this world to show how good his memory is. No perfect master has ever come here to show that he's the strongest athlete. A perfect living master has come here only to show that if we are a seeker, we can experience love in associating with him. Very simple. And when we associate with a perfect living master with love, we have made a compact with heaven because love goes right up to heaven. Nothing can break it. Everything else can be broken. Everything else can be turned topsy-turvy. But the love of the master cannot be turned. A great lesson I learned from great master. There is nothing like it. To be the beloved of the perfect living master, man, you need nothing else. <laughs> you need nothing else out. Because everything is taken care of. Everything else falls into place. We waste our time, we waste our resources, and we run around trying to settle small, small things in a limited life, lifespan. And one focal point, one great master, one perfect living master coming into our life puts everything in place. And everything happens in an organized way, automatically. We are left to rejoice, like we are watching a show and enjoying it. And not caught in the pain and turmoil of having to live day to day in this world. This is the effect a great master has upon us. My friends, you realize why I am, I am here on the 2nd of April? On the 2nd of April 1948, the great master left his physical body and left his seekers and his disciples with a form in which he manifested inside so that we could have a permanent relationship with him just like we had when he was walking. This is the first thing a master teaches us. That when you get initiated by a perfect living master, you should quickly establish your link with the inner form of the master. So you are never without a master. It is not a relationship on a physical level. It starts on a physical level because we know nothing. As we get to know the truth, we develop this relationship and through initiation, we are able to have a contact with the master inside. And that lasts forever. It lasts beyond the life of these bodies. Don't forget, any physical master that we know of, or whose names we can take, including great masters, they came, born, took their body, gave us a message, touched us with love, died, left the body. The body is not here anymore. If the body was the reality, we are free, we don't have the reality. Body was not the reality. The reality was the spirit inside. And they came, became flesh, manifested themselves, put us in touch with the spirit, and then made us permanently attached to the master forever. Not for a short span of their physical life. And this has always been so. And will always be so. Their truth, their real form is not the physical form. Physical form is very temporary. They die and we die. In this physical form, nobody lives forever. It's only an opportunity. When destiny casts such an opportunity that we come across in one physical form of a seeker, the physical form of the enlightened one, the one who has already sought and become one with the sought. When such a situation comes, we establish a permanent relationship. Therefore, once initiated by a perfect living master, our contact is permanent, forever. It's not limited to the life of that person. It's not limited to the dissolution of this universe. It's not limited to millions of years. It is beyond time. A perfect living master's initiation goes beyond all this. Therefore, it's one of the greatest things that can happen. Somebody asked me, what is the greatest thing that can happen? Very greatest in the destiny of a human being. Is there something, according to my experience, now that I have retired, I should look back and say, how well did I see this world? What are the best things that can happen? What happened to me and what can happen to another fellow being in this world? I'll say, the very best thing that can ever happen to a fellow being or a person is 
to look at the face of a perfect living master in physical form. Nothing like it. If one can look at the face of a perfect living master once in a lifetime, you made it. Because you are destined thereafter to find a perfect living master. Whether it's this life or next life or when, there is no way to erase it. The negative powers, the mental powers, the top rulers of these regions, the Brahma who controls this cannot erase this. Go in and see. The great master said, go in and see the effect of physically seeing the face of the perfect living master. Look into his eyes. See it once. You got your certificate. You cannot go away. Some people say, well, this was a great thing because I remember uh, Dr. Isher Singh, one of the great you know, famous Mastana, uh, intoxicated disciples of great master. He would say, Master, I like that man a lot. He doesn't like you at all. He hates you. But I love him so much, I want him to see you once. After he has seen you once, he can go, I don't care. But a strange thing used to happen. People who hated the great master, saying he is playing upon the minds of people. He is doing mind games and he is trying to do this and he is using magic and he is a great magician and he is a great uh, hypnotist. All kinds of things were said about him. But the man who said these things and hated the great master, he once came and looked on him, something would start happening. After a few years he would say, he should think that go back and see him again. <laughs> there was something about him. The great master said, doesn't matter. A person can see the face of a great master today and die next day. He's still saved. No way to take that benefit away. Therefore, the greatest thing that can happen in human destiny, in human life is to be able to see the face and the eyes of a perfect living master walking upon this earth in a human body. The second greatest thing after that, of course, which follows, is to get initiated by that master. The day one is initiated, by a master. Initiation here means that the master inside breaks the link with the law of karma and puts the link with the law of the world. Therefore, you are no longer bound by the same forces which determine your destiny, which have been determining so far. You are now bound by the words and the rules of the unspoken word. In fact. It's a very great thing. People sometimes come and say, Oh, I want initiation. Tell me the five words. <laughs> initiation is not words. Initiation is not five words, nor is it five thousand words. Initiation is no word. Initiation is the word. It's the word that you cannot speak, which cannot say five. That is the word that is initiation. That's inside. What a master does when he initiates us is at that region where the word resounds in us, which we are not even listening to with our nine doors all opening outside, with our approaches turned to this world, with our senses and desires focused upon these material attachments here, we're not even listening to that word. What are we talking about the words? Initiation takes place when the inner word is attached to the attention of the soul. And thereafter there's no turning back. Then your whole movement, even in destiny, even in re creation in this world, even in incarnation, is governed by a totally different set of laws. It's not governed by these laws of birth and rebirth and karma. And we keep on saying, oh, your karma, somebody who's got initiated shouldn't worry about karma at all. In fact, if you ask me, somebody who's initiated should not worry, period. <laughs> Why about karma? Why about anything? What is there to worry after that? I have not known, I have not known anything worth while worrying, if you are initiated. I have not known anything that can make a person legitimately worry with any good benefit after you are initiated. If you have a perfect living master entrenched in you inside through initiation and you have contact with the word inside, where is the case for worrying? How can you worry? But a lot of people worry. I tell them, why are you worrying? Are you initiated? Yeah. 
Why are you worrying? Oh, so terrible. What is terrible? Oh, we are going through this bad karma. So what? <laughs> One of the good, good mantras I learned early on. The two words, so what? <laughs> One of the best mantras in life. We are unnecessarily worried. We do not know what we've got. We do not know what we are missing. We don't know what we have got. We don't know anything. We don't know our master. We don't know the spiritual path. If somebody says, I am on the spiritual path and is still worrying, he does not know the spiritual path. This spiritual path takes the worry out of our life. If we have a master and we have a focal point, we live in the will of the master, we use the ups and downs of life in order to survive as a seeker, there is nothing to worry. It's the most beautiful path. It's the most beautiful situation one can have. Tell me something better than this. Nobody has been able to bring out anything better. To be initiated by a perfect living master. Nothing like it. So to remember such a great master, I said, I want to look at the water and this bank on the 2nd of April every day. Every year. Every 2nd April I come and see. Clarence said, I also want to see. He thought, sir, I'll come and he'll see the beard of the master. I don't know what he wanted to see. I said, we will see the magic of the great master. And he was probably looking great master floating in the sky. I don't know what he was. He was a good friend of mine. He bought this house. We are very grateful to him. I'm sure you all appreciate that he has been opening the door of this house all these years, all these nine years, to let us have the bandara or the celebration in tribute to the great master. Let's thank him for that. Thank you, Clarence. You've done this for nine years. I don't know whether you do for another nine years or is it the last one? We don't know. He'll tell us about it. Sometimes he says he's going to sell this house. So if he sells this house, we'll find some other river or some other bank or some other waterway and see if he can build a little hut of our own. Is anybody interested in building a hut of your own? Oh we may have many huts there. We have come on the 2nd of April year after year and I see a miracle every time I am here. Not to mention that I see miracles every day the rest of the year too. <laughs> but there has been no bandara that I haven't seen miracles. But some have come and told me they see miracles too. That they have had this experience on the 2nd of April every time. Many of you have come for many years here. How many have come here for more than 3 years? Can you raise your hand? Quite a few. Okay, please raise your hands. Has any one of you who's come for so long seen miracles on the 2nd of April in their life when they come? He is half handed. <laughs> Thank you. This is a great day because at least on this day, our mind gets focused on the truth. When I think of that, I say every day should be a bandara because we need to focus our mind on the truth every day. We don't need it only once a year. We should do it every day. We need every day. Just like there is a festival of lights and uh, Swamiji in one of his poems talks about the festival of lights. It is celebrated once a day. It's called Diwali or Deepavali. And Swamiji in, in his book, one of the masters says, saints have their Diwali every day. They celebrate it every day, the festival of lights. They don't keep it for once a day. Similarly, if the object of this gathering here, Bandara, is to think of the Lord and remember Him, every day should be treated like a Bandara. We should remember the Lord every day. But our mind being what it is, thank God we, uh, we create occasions. We create these lampposts to remind us. And so this Bandara is one of those days. Great Master came on the bank of the river, Pyas. Before He came, he came to look for a master. No, he didn't come to look for a master. Sorry, he was already found by a master up in the hills. Great master knew nothing about the bank of the river. Great master got a diploma in engineering from Thompson Engineering College in Rudki. <laughs> That's another Thompson. <laughs> from Thompson Engineering College, great master got a diploma 
in engineering and became an engineer, worked on the mountains, on the roads, in a, in a place very close to Islamabad in uh, Pakistan now. And he was walking and working and he always looked for Guru. He always said, one day I'm going to find a perfect master. And every time a man wearing orange colored, saffron colored robes would come, he would look after him and run and say, are you my master? And the man said, yeah, yeah, of course. And he would say, this is not the master. <laughs> then one day, his master came. <laughs> Baba Jamal Singh came. He walked by, and great master just passed by. He didn't even ask him anything. And Baba Jamal Singh, who was his master? He walked by, looked at him. And after he walked a few steps ahead, there were three other disciples with Baba Jamal Singh, walking with him. He turned around, he says, I have come to this mountain for that man's sake. He is my disciple. They said, what? He didn't even greet you. He didn't even say hello. He didn't even properly look at you. And he just passed by and you say, he is your disciple? He said, yes, wait for three days. So when Babaji was giving his uh, discourses in Komari, on the third day the great master heard there was a guru and he said, let me also go and hear him. And he was, of course, taken aback by seeing him and his message. So it just fits him. He knew he was ready for that. And then he came and then he came to the river. And Babaji said, do you know how I came to the river here? I didn't know myself. I was initiated by a master who lives 500, 600 miles away. I didn't know I was going to come to this river. Swamiji, my master lives 600 miles away. <clears throat> I found him by chance, totally by coincidence. I had gone for something else to attend somebody's wedding. I didn't know there's a master there. And how, how I came to this river and the bank of this river. There used to be a little fellow, <clears throat> a small fellow. People used to call him crazy. <clears throat> he used to dance in the river near these things. He used to be crazy and just dance and talk in a crazy way. And he said, oh, this is going to be the center. Oh, this is going to be the center. <laughs> Nobody knew what he was talking about because there was no center. There was nothing there. Till Babaji came and built the first small hut there. And then a second hut and a third hut came up. And he began to discourse in that little place in the, in the jungle almost, with the trees all around. Nobody knew that is going to be the foundation of the great Dera, where people from all around the world, including the apartheid-stricken South Africa, come every year. To look at the master. Nobody knew at that time that this was the foundation of a dera. And the great master sat there, he loved the river, he would walk up to the river, and he did such a good job there. And while, while there, he used to say, the dera is such a beautiful place because people come here with spiritual ideas. And only such people should come who want to get spiritual fruits. Not to exploit and say we'll make a Disneyland here or something. <laughs> There's too many Disneyland, too many uh, distractions already. People should come into the Dera who want to enter into the Disneyland inside their head. Those who want to fly into higher regions. Those who want to get the real thing, the real goodies should come here. So it built up the Dera. Gradually, people would come and I grew up slowly and watched the dera grow. They watched from how from three huts it became into five and ten and twenty and how a real no electricity, nothing. People went to the rivers for toilets and uh, gradually toilets came up and it was such a small beginning of such a great experiment, even physically. When I remember the dera, I said that was something which I saw before my own eyes. People would come and they would do seva, service. They knew that service is so important for people afflicted by their minds. There's nothing like seva. Either you do meditation or you do seva. What else can you do? If you can't do meditation because your mind doesn't let you do, then do seva. Seva means service. Service of people, service of the Lord. In any form, there can be four kinds of service. The service with your body, You can go, dig, build, work, pick up the bricks, pick up the bags, all seva, the body. 
you can do seva with the money seva with the money you can write a check buy something buy cash kind get some grain for the people get some bread for the people to eat work in a kitchen and bring some food or there seva of the mind do meditation think of the lord repeat his name inside out of these three sevas the highest is the seva of the mind and that takes us to the ultimate seva which is to go within and meet the lord seva is the four step way to god why worry about other things so people who have so distressed with their mind they found the dera a great place they would work and when they work they didn't say oh i come in my in my mercedes you you come in your oh, ordinary toyota or something okay the japanese car unpatriotic japanese car okay my seva is better than yours not like that people came and did seva equally i knew a man who's uh, who were card seen in india you heard of colonel burke one of the sangeet is passed on now he went to india and he saw uh, he had a bag first time he went to the dera and he found he had a heavy bag so one man came running and said may i help you so oh, you can speak english good carry so he carried him and he gave him a tip the juice to they were giving a dollar here or a quarter or whatever he was giving here he gave 5 rupees 5 rupees is equivalent of about a quarter so he gave a quarter from his pocket he says a tip he says no 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 thank you i don't need it i just did it to help you so no 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 he had a thought to his mind these poor indians these nations she's so deprived of all these physical things they are only looking after spiritual things i have come for the first time thank god i am rich and i can also afford this so he went in and they didn't he didn't accept the tip later on in the evening in the meeting with the master he saw the same man sitting there so he was reintroduced to him and then he realized that that man is not a millionaire but a billionaire in india he owns about 40 industrial factories in different cities one of the richest men of the country who was doing seva he was uh, piling up the heap of dirt like anybody else in the dera and this man couldn't believe that he came up to help him like uh, he was in need of a small tip he suddenly realized it. it's not only that man had more spiritual wealth he had even the physical wealth and i couldn't recognize him it really big, made a big impact on him in the dera you could never know <clears throat> it was not to go and show off your riches the idea of the dera seva in the dera was not to show who is rich and who is poor but to show how much love you have for the master to give a donation to the dera did not mean i can give a bigger fatter check so i am a better satsang leader a better follower it was how much i can afford that i am following my rule of 10% right it was nothing to do with any status or anything everybody was equal and then they gathered all the food they did everything and ate together jointly in the common kitchen and they rejoiced and it was such a wonderful living in fact it's very difficult to find this was happening in the midst of a strife torn country where so many class distinctions are taking place where caste system took root there is still talk of the caste system in the midst of this caste system was a little dera where there was no caste system at all totally classless society was sitting there and all created by the love of a master nothing else could have created that nobody was given training in socialism or given training in equalities there was no lectures no classrooms it was the love of the master the desire to do seva and not to and to suppress the ego suppress the mental ego that was coming in their way so i remember those beautiful things here we have already thank clarence for making this a temporary dera atmosphere for us at least for me he did it i'm very grateful wherever he makes another dera atmosphere we'll be happy to go isn't that right <laughs> yeah if he doesn't do it somebody else will do it and he may come to that uh, dera but i am sure we will continue to have with the with the great work that great master has started and the way he is doing it the way the west has come to uh, come to this situation come to this point in growth in spiritual growth to take advantage of it i think this is the right time to celebrate the work of the great master and i use this 
Vandana Day to pay tribute to him, to say, all I ever got was from one man, the great master. I pay tribute to him. I was able to uh, live a wonderful, happy life, live a life of uh, great exaltation in the physical world and in any other world that he created. Mm -hmm. And I have no complaints and no regrets at all after my retirement. I am looking forward to a beautiful exit when the call comes. I am in a beautiful state and all this credit, credit for all this goes to great master. And he did it not for me as an exception. He showed the way. He said there is one way to go and take it. And the way is inside, not outside. Don't run too much outside. Don't make it a mission that if you get the message outside, you have to run again outside to get the same message. You get the message and start running the right direction. Somebody tells you go this way, you don't go again to ask him, please tell me again which way to go. So we have been told that the right direction is within. Go within. Go within. Master is inside. God is inside. Destination is inside. Truth is inside. Everything we have to find is inside. All we need is a help in handling our own mind. The Master will give you all the help when you are ready. Thank you very much. The, some of the sevadars, those who have done service, have prepared some nice food for us. And traditionally in the Dera, on 2nd of April, we have been celebrating the, the greatness of the Master by sharing food and enjoying ourselves on the Bandara. So I think we have nice food served for us. Food has been a, a long tradition of celebration in India. Maybe we were poor, maybe we didn't have enough food and we got goodies that day. Or somehow the celebration feasting has been associated with the celebration. So we have been feasting even in Great Master's days, 29th December, which was the day when his master left his physical body. Every year, 29th December, we would gather and he would uh, give the food and get it made. We all, the, the ladies who cooked the food, mostly ladies cooked, some men helped. And they sang nice hymns and nice tunes and they were in great high intoxicated spiritual mood when they prepared the food. Food tasted so good. Even ordinary dal was so wonderful. So I don't know if anybody's tasted dal. It's very simple. But the whole food, chapatis, cooked in large quantities, the baked chapatis. And we enjoyed and they tasted excellent on Bandara Day. Sometimes we would sneak a few and take them with us <laughs> because of the day. So feasting has been part of it. Just to, just to carry with us the fond memory. But when I came to this country uh, to study at Harvard in the 60s and later on traveled around to see, attend Bandaras, I found that they copied this tradition. Many satsangis and followers of Master copied the tradition of the Bandara and they all had feasts. They would prepare nice feasts. But then they used to say the Bandara was excellent, food was good. That food was the only thing in the Bandara. I, I want to remind you, please forget that. Food is only an adjunct. The real thing is the message of the great master. The real thing is to find the truth within. Let's not mix up the truth with the festivities. Food is part of the festivity. So he's a great Bandara, we had great food. So that is a, a, a half truth in fact. Because great Bandara is when we then we were able to change ourselves, change our lifestyle, look inwards and see what, the, what we, did we do since the last Bandara that we shouldn't have done and what we should do now. If this happens on 2nd of April, it's a great Bandara. Food or no food. But if the food is good, you can enjoy that too. So as usual, they have a few limited number of uh, chairs there and uh, to keep up the old tradition, they draw names from a box. So some names have been drawn just before I started here in a box and those names, and those who came up on the names can sit there, the rest can enjoy themselves here. And there will be a snack later on. As I told some of you who were present here in the last Bandara, I did not, did not bring the shoes of Babaji nor the cup of Great Master to this Bandara. And I explained the reason last time. The reason was that many people started thinking I was just introducing a new ritual, a new cult. This is totally against 
the teachings of the great master. The great master says that teachings of masters have been vitiated by people making them into rituals, making them into ceremonies, making them into religions and cults. So I saw the danger signal myself that people were more interested in the old shoes than in the teachings. They were thinking the cup that I carried held more power than what was inside in their own consciousness. That was not the purpose. So with your agreement, I decided to cut that ritual crap out. <laughs> I, I, still, I still think those shoes and the cup is the most valuable physical possession in my life. I won't exchange it for billions of dollars. I'll not. But that is not because of the quality of the leather nor the kind of sterling silver used in the cup. That is because of the love I saw from those people who gave this to me. It's the love that is invaluable. It's not the material thing. So if you ever happen to get something which you value because of its association with the master, it's of great value to you. Nothing can beat it. Hold on to it. Hide it. <laughs> Maybe I didn't hide it. Enough. <laughs> and when you share, instead of sharing the physical thing, Share the joy and the love that you got out of it. That's why I didn't bring it this time. But we will still have a afternoon informal session of storytelling, like Joel always likes, some stories of great master and some questions and answers later on. And then there will be a snack, a small snack, a short meal before we leave. And the snack will again have that lottery box for a few people to come in. And those names will be revealed later on. Now, uh, who has the names? You have the names? Marianne will read out the names and we'll go and have our dinner. Thank you.